Awesome. Great. Welcome, everybody, to our first SSI Fellows community call. I'm going to go ahead and share my slides again. Okay. Right. Yes, welcome. Um, if you were with us for CW20, some of this will look familiar. Um, but basically, our new motto is to be kind, be understanding, and be flexible, um, mainly to yourself and also with others. Um, it's going to replace our better software, better research logo, I'm sure of it. Um, we do have a code of conduct. It's linked at the top of the notes. Um, please feel free to report any issues to myself or Schwabe, but in general, be kind to each other, use inclusive languages, um, and we don't support um, or tolerate, obviously, harassment of any kind. Uh, we are recording this call and we hope to make the video available um, on the SSI YouTube channel after that in case uh, there were some fellows who couldn't make it. Um, so please turn on your video if you don't mind sharing your face or turn it off if you do. Uh, keep yourself muted when not speaking in order to minimize background noise. Um, and using the notes document, uh, do please feel free to take notes, ask any questions, plus one, engage with each other. Um, and I'm going to do my best to avoid showing them in the in the recording, but keep in mind that it might happen um, accidentally. So because this is the first uh, SSI Fellows community call, um, we might adapt and change the format of it um, over the next couple of runs uh, until we find a format that suits you best. This is your community. We want to provide you um, with what you want and what you need. Um, but in general, the goals of these calls are to facilitate community building and encourage collaboration within the SSI fellows community. Uh, we want to check in with our fellows um, and provide community care. So what are you up to and how can we support you? And we also want to provide a welcoming and inclusive space for fellows to share and explore topics of interest and network with others. So today um, we'll have updates from three fellows, uh, Stephen, Yo, and Pablo. And then the second half of the event will focus on moving your events online. So I'll talk a bit about how SSI can support you doing this. And then we're going to split into breakout rooms and uh, get some insights and share experiences with each other. And I'm going to hand over to our new uh, communications officer, Jacqueline, to introduce herself. Yep. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jacqueline. I think most of you will have heard of me because I sent out an email recently pestering everyone to write blogs to celebrate the 10th year of the Software Sustainability Institute. Um, if you have any things that you want promoted on the Institute's social media, you can get in touch with me. I can stick things on our Twitter. I'll put up um, blog posts and news posts on our website as well. So. If you've attended a good event you've written up, then that can go up on the website. Um, if you've written any blogs as well on a, maybe you've got a personal blog and you think it, that would be of interest to the wider community, then um, feel free to get in touch with me as well. And I can look at sharing that on the website too. And that's me. Awesome, thank you so much, Jacqueline. Uh, does anybody have any questions so far? Everybody good? We're actually on time. Neil told me that my timings were probably a bit ambitious, so we'll see how we go. Um, so now we're going to start with the fellows updates. Um, so these are opportunities for fellows to share or show and tell during our community calls. So each call we can accommodate up to three fellows who can each have a five minute slot plus a two minute Q&A uh, to introduce themselves and share any updates to the networks to the network. Um, and some examples of what you can share include fellowship plans, demos of projects, upcoming events or other activities, projects for which you're seeking support or collaboration. Um, and if you uh, have been a fellow for a while, then we'd love to hear uh, what's going on sort of beyond the fellowship and how it's impacted your career. So we'll hear uh, first from Stephen and then Yo and then Pablo. So I'll stop sharing. And Stephen, if you want to take it away, I put a link to um, a timer in the notes. So if you want to watch the countdown, if that's beneficial for you, then you can do that. But let me know when you're ready and I can start it. Can you see my slides? No. No. Okay. Then I failed in my attempt. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> uh, what have I done? I hit the share screen button and yeah. desktop and share. Okay. There you go. Okay. How about now? Perfect. Great. 
Okay, so uh, thank you, Rachel, for the chance to uh, present today. Um, what I'm showing here today, CoCheck, is actually, so I was a fellow from the 2013 round uh, a long time ago, and this is actually, a, strangely, a continuation of my fellowship idea, and we had a way, uh, sort of a marker in the sand back in 2017. Shoaib uh, was one of the co-authors of a paper we wrote that made some grounds in terms of sharing research software uh, underlying papers. CoCheck is the sort of latest incarnation of that idea. It's uh, joint work with Daniel Nust from uh, uh, Munster and we've been supported by the Mozilla Foundation uh, last year and we got a little bit of funds also from the SSI, thank you, uh, for, to kick things off last May. I'd also like to start by thanking Bruno Vieira who was at the 2015 Oxford meeting, I think, which the fellows had, who introduced me to the practicalities of Docker, which we've been uh, using ever since. So uh, I'd like to thank Bruno for that context. Um, so here's the four, the four bullet point summary of what CoCheck is. Step one, author sends CoCheck a link to their open access paper, Data and Code, along with instructions on how to run it. Two, the CoCheck acts as a sort of a peer reviewer, runs the code independently and checks if the key results like figures and tables can be reproduced in their own environment. If no, if there's a problem, you go to step three. Otherwise, yes, great, go to step four. Step three then is the co-checker then communicates the problems back to the author directly. So this is not anonymous peer review. This is direct uh, communication. And if the author can fix the problem, we return to step one with a revised uh, set of instructions or data. Uh, to try and generate the certificate in step four. And at step four, all we do is we write a certificate, which is like a peer review statement, just saying, these are the things that we could reproduce using the author's code and data. So a lot of journals are interested in this idea of reproducibility, quite obviously. Um, and one of the techniques gaining ground is this thing called Code Ocean, that some of you may be familiar with. Um, Code Ocean, uh, provides a web interface to your code with the notion that you provide a capsule of code and data that can be run on the web. And this is supposed to be runnable forever by everyone, which I think is quite a noble aim, and quite a high bar. CodeCheck goes to right to the bottom of the uh, reproducibility bar and just says, uh, did somebody at one point in time reproduce some of the code, uh, some of the results? So we're really sort of trying to do something as easy as possible just to get things uh, started. So what are the advantage of having a code check certificate? Uh, lots of things. Authors can verify their code works for somebody else. Not everyone writes Docker files yet. Um, so the yet is a link to my slides to a paper we're writing on uh, Docker files, if you're interested. Uh, code checkers, which we think will be early career researchers, gain experience with peer review. Uh, editors and reviewers can see that the code works. At the moment, it's not often checked during peer review in scientific papers. And readers, when they see the certificate, they have the confidence that code and data are available. So progress to date, we started with some historical papers, mostly in my field of interest, computational neuroscience. April this year, GigaScience produced the first, what we call the first real certificate. Uh, reporting the reproducibility of machine learning results, uh, which they blogged about in the blog. Um, COVID-19 then happened and I wondered what we could be doing constructively. And so I started code checking COVID papers from London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine, and then Imperial College. And hopefully by now you're all aware of the Imperial College link with the RSC world. Um, I was approached by a journalist and said, could you reproduce the results from this famous report 99 that was the sort of supposedly the basis of the government taking lockdown. There were lots of complaints at the time the code wasn't available and when they looked at it, it was horrible and messy. And the good news was that certainly with the re-implementation uh, supported by GitHub and Microsoft, we, I, could reproduce the, all the results uh, within a few percent of the original paper from, from March. So that uh, gave us a lot of uh, uh, publicity. Uh, Nature ran this story just a couple of weeks ago, and thanks to Jacqueline for running an article in the SSI. So my final slide is just on the next steps. Currently writing a paper to describe what code check is and how it runs. We're discussing with journals about how to get this into 
uh, a workflow at particular journals like eLife, PLOSCOM Bio, uh, GigaScience. Needs more money, like everything else, uh, primarily not for software, but for actually getting people to actually help running the system and finding the, uh, finding the code checkers and overseeing the project. And we'd like to build a community of code checkers. Uh, and I, th I would hope that some people on this call today might be interested to become those code checkers. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I think you have one question so far in the notes. Uh, did whoever ask it want to unmute and ask it? Otherwise, I can do that. I can do that. Um, so I was just wondering, given the, the nasty, nasty behavior from people um, on their code repos, did you get any of that backlash when you reproduced things? No, not yet. <laughs> um, we were certainly expecting uh some uh pushback but i think if people looked at it they would have just said oh well actually it is reproducible what what can, what more can they say um the only i think the only contentious issue was we are deliberately just saying that we could reproduce the results that somebody else you know that somebody else produced we're not saying that they're right right we're not going through and doing a check of the code and saying that line is correct or that matches to these equations it's just literally, we ran their code, this is what we got. And so there have been a couple of comments about that, but not in a negative sense. Okay, we have uh, time for one more quick question. Um, did whoever write that in the notes want to unmute and ask? Um, yeah, hello, this is Alejandra. And so I was involved in running a reproducibility initiative in a, in a conference, an international semantic web conference. And we kind of did similar, but without infrastructure. So we left the, what we call reproducers, what you call code checkers. Um, but one issue we face is that some, some of the code requires specific infrastructure like C GPUs. Have you considered that and do you, does code checker manages it? So we, we've got a, a statement. We have that problem too, as everybody would. If there's any custom hardware that's needed, then it's a problem. Um, so far, the biggest problem we hurdled was indeed a uh, hurdle we faced was indeed with report nine, the, the imperial model, because it takes a lot of compute time. Uh, and I was fortunate that our departmental computing officer helped me uh, get that onto the HPC. The COVID, the Microsoft had made it easy to run on there, and it was just the practicalities of getting it up and running and getting the job scripts in the right format. But that is a problem, and part of the if we're trying to turn this into a sort of a community infrastructure, on the one hand, it would be really great to just say, well, we've got this, we've got this compute resource at our, uh, at our fingertips that we can make use of, but somebody has to pay for it, right? And if it's significant jobs. So my, my get out clause at the moment is that if I can't run it on my workstation, I'm going to try and run it on the faculty compute resource. And if it doesn't work there, then maybe I'd come back to SSI and say, you know, is there any national resource like Archer we could make use of? Awesome, Thank thanks so much. Um, so we're out of time for questions for Stephen, um, but I think you're getting more um, in the notes if you wanna take a look at that and answer any of the questions there. And we'll go ahead and move on to you. Cool, okay, I will share my screen. And I'll um, use that cuckoo timer if, that, if you find that helpful. Uh, it's okay, I've got one set on my... Uh... Phone. Okay, so can we all see my uh, Open Life Science slides? Yes. Excellent. It's not in um, present mode yet, though. Let me press that. Of course, it's open on the wrong screen. Okay. Right. Okay, so um, I will make a start. Um, I'm here to talk today about Open Life Science. Uh, so I probably don't need to extol the virtues of Open Science to the SSI. <laughs> I'll assume you're already bought into the idea of Open Science. Um, but what uh, Open Life Science is, is designed to help people who do want to learn more about, about Open Science and to take their first steps in leading open science communities since uh, unfortunately I think one thing that we probably all recognize is that open science skills and community and people skills aren't necessarily prerequisites for academic positions. Um, so this is a program that is run by myself, uh, Malvika Sharan, who's also a fellow um, and I think she was masquerading as me earlier on Zoom. 
Uh, and we actually have quite a few uh, people who are also participating or helping out with the program here at the call as well today. So I'll talk about a bit more about that in a minute. Uh, first, I'll tell you what it is. Uh, so we have a 16 week training program. So what people do is they apply to Open Life Science with a uh, project, an open science project they have in mind. Now that could range anywhere from an idea to uh, it could be something more like a, um, an, an existing project or something that's even quite mature and has been running for 10 or 15 years. Um, but the idea is that they want to take active steps to make their community more effective, more inclusive, to involve other people and to use the most effective open methods that they can. Um, so I will move on a bit. Ah, yes, this, I will talk a bit about who we are. So this is myself, I'm Jo Novika, um, I mentioned she's here earlier, and Bernice Batu is the only founder for Open Life Science who actually isn't an SSI fellow. Um, and so we have the next application for Open Life Science open on the, is um, open at the minute and closing on the 30th of June. So to talk a little bit more about what the program actually is, um, so you might consider whether or not you want to be applying to it. Here is a overview of the first half of our train. Actually, no, it's the first half on the left and the second half on the right. Um, so we have a mixture of calls that are one-on-one -on -one mentoring. So you as a project lead, let's say you are the applicant, you will meet with your mentor, you will talk with them about what your goals are, what you hope to achieve, let's say by the end of the 16 weeks, or maybe even long, more long-term than that. And you meet with your mentor every other week, which you can see from the alternating patterns if you follow down. Um, and then on weeks when you aren't meeting with your mentor, you actually meet with a, a whole group of people who are working on exactly the same thing, who are working on some sort of open science related project. So if you look through week two, we have Welcome to Open Life Science. That tends to cover things like um, just getting to know one another and kicking off your project, your mission, vision, um, and goals for the next 16 weeks. Moving on to week four, we cover to topics like road mapping your tools and um, bringing other people into the community. We introduce people to GitHub, even if they aren't actually um, a tech project, we introduce people to GitHub because we find it's a very good collaborative tool. And then we cover open science methods like open data, open access, um, trying to think there's definitely things apart from that open hardware open source uh, basically we try and just touch on all of these things um, very briefly so it tends to be like a 10 minute guest speaker touches on each of these topics but it gives you enough of an idea and a grounding that you can then seek further things if you wish to uh, open science too up on the top right this is more about uh, disseminating your open science whether your outputs are traditional such as papers whether it's a preprint, whether it's software, or whether it's something else, maybe an open protocol. Um, so the idea is that we want you to think about open science in a much broader way than the traditional academic methods. Um, and then as we start to wrap up the project, uh, the program, we talk about things like your self-care, mental health care, looking after yourself if you've been uh, working your ass off for several weeks and probably longer to be fair because you're excited about an open science project as chances are you're probably exhausted and you are probably working more than you should be uh, but you can't actually take care of your community when you're not taking care of yourself we also talk about things like ally skills and inclusiveness as well. I'm aware that I am running out of time I'm quite trying to wrap this up so um, the final thing that we have is after you've been working for the 16 weeks on this program, you present everything. And so it's actually, this is actually live streamed to the rest of the world. So you can say, Here, here's what I've been working. Here's what I've learned. Come help me out in my project. And um, we're very interested in recruiting people. Or if you can help us just spread the word, we'd be really grateful. And I think that's probably everything I have time for. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Yo. Um, does anybody have any questions? I believe there's one in the notes if you want to unmute and ask your question. Uh, hi, Jo. Um, I was wondering, I mean, given the the program that you presented, I mean, I, I understand everyone has a project that needs about uh, probably is around life science, but what is a specific about life science on, on the training and how you focus, why did you focus on, on that domain? Um, so this is actually a really popular question. So quite honestly, you could fork our materials and 95% of it actually wouldn't be life science specific, but we all come from life science backgrounds. 
and a large amount of our network is life science. Um, plus, we also we need to scope it somehow. So it, it's an easy scope for us. Um, but practically speaking, we've had we've also taken a very broad view of life science. So we've had people, um, to be honest, who've just been open science in the previous call. Um, but yeah, it, it's a scoping thing, but it, it, it can be broader. Any other questions for you? Awesome, thank you so much, Yo. Um, really looking forward to the next round. Actually, I do have one quick question. Are you changing anything from the first round to the second round? A little bit. Um, so we did all of our work in Google Docs previously, um, a collaborative doc very similar to what we have here. We're probably going to make it HackMD instead because then we can archive it to GitHub now. Yeah, cool, thank you so much. All right, Pablo. Oh, I like your background too, Pablo. Would you like to unmute yourself? Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, so I'm going to present. Uh, there we are. So some of the work I've been doing related to uh, my fellowship and I'd like to begin with some workshops. So, uh, well, so the, the, my fellowship is organized around uh, open tools or tools for open science and in particular for open data and for data presentation, such as our markdown documents, uh, data dashboards, to present the, the data and allow the public and fellow researchers to access it in as complete a way as possible. Um, the tool that I use the most for this purpose is, is R, and as I mentioned, our markdown and data dashboards. So with this purpose in mind, I'm going to do a workshop at the UK Linguistics Conference 2020 on the 26th of July. Uh, so our markdown data dashboards and Binder. Binder is a, a tool many of you know already, Binder Hub. Uh, it's a Docker image, uh, allows you to put up Python, R Studio, uh, data dashboards as well any kind of document within our, our studio and possibly some other language. Um, so that I will present that, uh, it's a three hour workshop uh, and I would be grateful if anyone would like to um, to contribute as a helper or a colleague. Uh, then another one at the Carpentry Con uh, around August, mid August or end of August, same topic. Uh, also uh, welcoming uh, collaboration. And last, a uh, web application for the creation of, um, of uh, oh my, where's the link now? <laughs> of, uh, there we are, um, data, data sets in the experimental sciences where we can create within participant variables, between group variables, continuous, categorical, a whole set of uh, variables for a simulated data set for the purpose of either uh, training data science skills or for uh, power analysis, data simulation for, for uh, advanced studies. So either for beginners in data science or for researchers wanting to uh, analyze the data set before collecting the actual data. And the thing is, it, it reduces the time required for this from weeks or months for someone to learn the functions to a matter of a couple of hours or, or much less. So that's it. Uh, it's in under development. It's on GitHub as well. And I would also welcome any contributions. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Pablo. Well done to every, I always forget to do this. Well done for everybody else. Dave, David is really good at doing that. Um, uh, does anybody have any questions for Pablo?
I have a quick one. Um, for the uh, contributors and helpers that you're looking for, um, are there specific skill sets that you need? Like, does somebody have to be fluent in R, or can somebody help you if they're just familiar with the topics? Uh, everything, <laughs> really anything, uh, anything at all. So yeah, yeah, uh, on any level, definitely. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Yeah. I know we have some binder experts in the room as well as a lot of our users. So I had the yeah. same question. Do I need to know anything about cognitive linguistics to help? Because I, I'm afraid I don't. Oh, no, no. Okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> no don't, yeah. Awesome. Um, any final questions for Pablo? Okay, let's thank all of our fellows again. Okay, I'll go back to sharing my screen. All right, so next uh, for the second half of the call, we're going to talk about moving your events online. Um, and because a lot of the fellowship um, your plans are centered around um, a lot of in-person events and training. Um, we want to help you during this uh, time of COVID-19 and uh, generally working remotely and not traveling um, to help you sort of shift your activities online. Um, so how can SSI support you in this? Um, we have an SSI community Zoom room, so the one we're in right now, um, that you're very welcome to use. Um, if you want to book it um, to use as a parallel account um, in maybe a larger event, or if you sort of be it a Zoom room um, as a one-off, please do uh, shoot me an email or private message me in the Slack, and we can arrange a, a booking for you as well as any practice or test sessions. Um, with the account, it can host up to a maximum of 100 participants and the meetings can be up to 24 hours. Um, and will allow you to claim host for the meeting by providing the host key um, at the time of booking. Um, but what can sort of current uh, inaugurated fellows use their fellowship funds for? Um, so this is predominantly um, geared towards 2019 and 2020 fellows. We still have fellowship funds to spend, um, but we should be able to support um, individual pro Zoom account subscriptions. Um, should you need it, uh, software and other subscription services. Um, I should mention these are sort of broad categories and, um, and there are sort of maybe nitty gritties within each category that we could discuss um, if you have any questions. Um, but hardware accessories such as headsets, microphones, webcams, uh, storage and compute services, training for online events, private, uh, prizes for online events, um, but very, very generally speaking, kind of anything with a receipt, um, but it has to further your fellowship aims and um, is in line with the University of Edinburgh Finance Expenses Policy. So it can't just be things that would be nice to have. Um, in general, things like monitors, um, laptops, et cetera, should be provided by your um, home institution. Um, so the things that you uh, would like to use your fellowship funds on should support your fellowship goals. Um, and just a quick caveat is we are currently checking um, with Edinburgh Finance on specifics of what is excluded. Um, but the process for this is that you'll need to submit a funding request like you normally do in LOFAT and justify how what you are requesting will further your fellowship aims. So maybe instead of um, you know, justifying what, why you want to travel to a specific conference, maybe you want to justify um, why you need some video editing software. Um, and it's because you want to create, you know, web content, uh, you know, demonstrating certain, um, certain topics. Uh, your request must be in line with the University of Edinburgh Finance Expenses Policy, and I'm going to keep tripping on that, um, but that's linked in the notes document. Um, in general, the fellow will need to purchase what they are requesting up front and then submit an expense claim through LOFAT uh, for reimbursement. Um, it can get quite complicated and tricky if you need finance to book it for you and it can really hold up the process um, and it might take a long time for you to get it. So that's why um, in, in all except for maybe the extreme cases, uh, you need to be able to purchase it up front yourself. Uh, we prefer as few expense claims as possible. Uh, so for example, if you've got something with a monthly subscription, if you're able to bundle those up and to fewer expense claims, that would be great. Um, and requests will be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. 
Um, so that's the sort of catch all statement. Um, so like we're not going to just automatically um, approve a sort of pro zoom subscriptions for everybody. Um, you do need to justify why you need it for your fellowship. Um, I know a lot of us have been given um, sort of staff accounts at our various institutions, but if that's something that you need for your fellowship, um, which I think a lot of people might, um, then, then do feel free to submit a request for that. Um, does any SSI folk want to jump in on anything I said just then? All good. Um, for pre-2019 fellows, um, we do still have that communal pot of funding for your events and it will be subject to the same conditions. Um, you'll just need to justify why you need it a little bit harder. <laughs> Um, and we'll assess those on a case-by-case -case basis. So I'll just go ahead and submit those through the fact. Um, we're also here if you want to consult on your virtual events or activities that you're running. So feel free to shoot me an email um, or message me or anybody on um, the Slack workspace if you want to arrange a meeting where we can help you um, and provide advice on a virtual event or activity that you want to run. And then in the notes document, um, I've added a list of various resources, but if folks on the call have their own resources that they find really useful for moving events online, then please do add them to that list. Um, we've also made all of our collaborations workshop uh, 2020 online documentation um, and resources available via Figshare if you want to reuse any of those. And if you have any questions about any of that, um, do let me know. Um, but just, do any of the fellows have any questions based on that very quick run through? Cool. Rule of thumb, if it has a receipt um, and you can get reimbursed for it and you can justify that it furthers your fellowship aims, we should hopefully be able to support you. Um, and we'll of course contact finance um, if there are any sort of um, random cases. Um, but now we're going to go ahead and go into breakout rooms and this will give you the opportunity to network with each other. Um, so do say hello and introduce yourself. Um, and then uh, if you could explore some of the following prompts or any of your own that come up, such as do you have experience running or attending online events, what worked well, what didn't work well, how have you adapted uh, your activities or events uh, due to coronavirus, um, is an online event as useful as a face-to-face -face one, and then anything else that comes up. And there's a section in the notes document uh, called shared insights. So if you could uh, write down sort of the main takeaways from your breakout rooms there, that would be great. And then we can uh, do some share outs when we come back. Are there any questions about that? All good, I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm going to create some breakout rooms. And there you, well, this is it. Okay, I'm opening the rooms now. And you'll have 12 minutes in your rooms. Welcome back. Can everybody hear me okay? Cool. Um, I hope you found that useful. Um, it looks like people have already started um, writing down um, some of their takeaways in the collaborative notes document. So if you haven't yet, please do um, take notes on what you covered. Um, it would be, it'll be really useful for everybody else. Um, but would anybody like to unmute and share some advice about moving events online? Don't be shy. I'm happy to <laughs> to say something. Um, so I, I used a lot of what the SSI did to run an event that wasn't primarily on software, although we invited people to talk about uh, software projects, uh, but it was about Dickens, Charles Dickens for the 150th anniversary of his death. And we used some of the things that you used. Um, so we had Slack channels, uh, we had shorter sessions, we still had papers and parallel sessions, and um, we used breakout rooms for networking. And it was an interesting experiment because the technological level of expertise was so much lower, <laughs> so much lower. And we had a, quite a few non-academic participants who were really struggling to like sign into Zoom. This is the level of technological difficulty we were having. Um, but it, it went very well and people, people really enjoyed it. But what they really particularly enjoyed was the breakout rooms. 
and using those for networking. And we had a couple of sessions where I put people in groups for five minutes and then in another group for five minutes uh, with some prompt questions. And people have raved about it for the last two weeks since the event. People really love that. So um, I know it can sometimes feel a bit awkward, but I think that serendipity of those kinds of conversations in breakout rooms <laughs> has been really good. And thank you to the SSI for, for letting me shamelessly <laughs> copy that. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. That's really nice to hear. Um, yeah, I've seen um, from the notes so far, uh, somebody mentioned a few other platforms and one of them is um, gather.town. And I think that also focuses on the networking aspect because you can actually like move around to different tables and like talk to people and network with people at the different tables. And then there's like a stage for speakers. So that's something I want to look into a bit more because that looks like a lot of fun. Um, does anybody else want to share anything? A lot of what's coming out of the notes is to definitely think about how long your online event or activity is. So um, a lot of people are experiencing Zoom fatigue and especially with a lot going on um, working from home. Uh, shorter meetings are better, um, more breaks are better, especially um, if you're stuck staring at your computer all day and I get headaches sometimes. Um, so smaller chunks are better. Pre-recording, lecturing, looks like it goes well. I know Andrew's been doing that. He's putting together. Um, I don't know if you want to share that, Andrew, what you're working on. Uh, yeah, I, want, I was actually saying in our room, I went to a really good webinar run by Emily Nordman last week talking about how to improve uh, sort of the online teaching experience uh, with the idea being that you sort of, you really don't have long videos in your documents. Uh, you also invest in a decent microphone, uh, which really helps because just from a sort of cognitive load point of view, uh, you know, the better you can make the whole perceptual experience, I think, for people, uh, the learners, uh, that, then the better. Um, but I think that the basic message is uh, everybody's uh, learning a lot at the moment about how best to do these things. And I also suspect that we really know for sure uh, until we're actually doing it. What works Absolutely. Best. Absolutely. Um, Schwab is currently putting together as well a guide for online training. So that should be um, published on the SSI website soon. Um, and we'll, we'll let you guys know when that happens um, in case that's uh, helpful to you. Um, we find it extremely useful, especially for um, carpentry style lessons as well. Um, any final thing anybody wants to share? Can I just add something? Hey, it's Phil. Sorry, can I just add something to what Andrew said there? Something that um, Emily started at Glasgow that's actually worked out really nicely is sort of a Netflix party of lectures in a weird sort of way. So we record the lecture into like 20 minute slots and then we actually watch it with the students. We watch ourselves giving a lecture with the students and we answer questions. We're sort of our own teaching assistant to some degree. So you record the lecture, watch it back with the students and you answer the questions as you go along sort of thing. So it's, it's just a kind of a, a nice way of thinking about what you can do with kind of these things as opposed to trying to give just an hour online lecture that's sort of pointless, you know, so. Absolutely. That sounds really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. That's something that JupyterCon are planning on doing for their um, keynote sessions actually is them pre-recording them and having like watch parties nice awesome well thank you everybody um for sharing your insights and experiences um again if you want to chat more about anything or have sort of uh, a one-to-one -one meeting about an event or activity that you're hosting um do feel free to get in touch and if i'm not particularly helpful with the activity that you're running then um we can get you connected to somebody who can um so i'm just going to share my screen. Um, right, so we're just going to wrap up now and find a few minutes. Uh, so at the very bottom of the Collaborative Notes document, there is uh, some space for feedback. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind, uh, we would love to hear it. Um, and that's basically so that we can adapt these calls so that they suit you best. Um, so if you have any particular feedback on the format or um, any topics that you want to cover in the future or the length of the call, um, that would be really, really useful. Um, so our next call is going to be on Monday, the 20th of July. Um, we're going to try and uh, uh, switch around days that we have these calls just to sort of maximize the number of people we can attend in case Tuesdays are not good for some people. 
Um, so there's a link to a Judo poll to uh, help determine which time is best, and I'll send that to the entire um, all fellows list as well. And then we have a forum if you would like to sign up to be one of um, our speakers on the next call. And if I don't get any, then I'll start targeting you. Um, there's also space at the bottom of the notes to share any upcoming events or calls. I know a few people have added some already. Um, as well as if you want to add any requests for peer assist, collaboration, um, or support, um, as well as any other updates um, or shares or shout outs that, that you want to mention. I know a few people on the call have new jobs. Uh, so if you want to add those, uh, you're more than welcome and congratulations to you. Um, but otherwise, does anybody want to unmute and share anything about an event or activity or update? Well, I'll go ahead and congratulate Becca and Yo, who I know both are starting new jobs. Um, congratulations. And if, I, if there's anybody else that I don't know, then congratulations to you too. Feel free to share. Um, right. And um, other than that, uh, please do leave some feedback and have a great evening and a great week ahead. It was great Thank to see you, you all. Thank you for hosting. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Bye, bye, -bye. bye everyone. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you.